Hey, he's giving me eternal life. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? Take your songbook, stand with us, turn over to page 347. Page 347, we're going to sing this chorus for a few weeks. Amen? All right, let me get my place here. There was a giant of laziness who said I will go and witness for the one who set me free. I come from out the wilderness, I witness now I know. I want that mountain, it belongs to me. I want that mountain, I want that mountain. Where the milk and honey flow, where the grapes and lettuce will grow. I want that mountain, I want that mountain. The mountain that my Lord has given me. Sing the third. What faithless giant upon the crest of mountains from the heights. Let's doubt that he's the one who's made me free. I'll climb from out the wilderness and trust a hopeless might. I want that mountain in me. Tim preached that message about witnessing. Boy, that was a pretty awesome verse, wasn't it? I like that. Hey, all you got to do is tell them what the Lord did for you. Yes, sir. Boy, I tell you what, he's awesome, isn't he? What a Savior we serve. Sing the last now. Let every giant of this settle for uh, just being mediocre, but I'll tell you what, I think we should be ascending to the hill of the Lord. And the Word of God says, who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Amen. They that have a pure heart and clean hands. And there is a mountain to conquer, and God has said to you and I uh, that I'm going to give you that mountain. It is yours. Uh, we're working on that in Sunday school. That is our theme for the next few weeks as the classes begin to ascend that mountain for the Lord and uh, many, many wonderful things uh, in the next few weeks on Sunday school. Now you get someone and uh, bring them to Sunday school and uh, make that a reality as we conquer that mountain. Brother Sammy will be saying more to us about that tonight and challenging you for the days to come. And uh, of course, I was, I was given so many notes that I have about lost track of the notes, but uh, pray for uh, Sheila McFarland's parents. Uh, her dad is in CCU. His name is Bill. We're praying for that one. Pray for her mother's biopsy for breast cancer that the Lord would touch there uh, in that matter. A nice uh, uh, thank you note right here from our friends uh, that were with us and going down to West Africa to the deaf ministry, uh, not down to Gahana, and uh, to the deaf ministry down there. We're praying uh, for them that God would touch them in a very, very special way. This note right here from Shelby Green. And let me share this with you, dear church family. Thank you for the love and support for me and my family. Sometimes I wonder how I'm going to make it. But then I feel the prayers and love and support. Thank you for all that you have done. I am missing being in the service issues here this morning. I thank God for that. And I thank you all uh, every day. Pray, for, uh, uh, pray that I make it through the semester as it has uh, proven to be a challenging one already. And uh, so you pray for the, our students in school, for Shelby. Uh, she is uh, juggling a lot, a lot right now, and we are praying for her as she deals with these matters. And God bless you. She's got some mountains to uh, climb and mountains to conquer. And so you just, hey, you keep, stay in prayer. Pray for them. Praying for Brother Bob uh, as the Lord touches him in a very special way and his needs. Praying for Brother uh, Kennard's uh, sister in Mississippi. She'll be having her, one of her kidneys removed in this coming week. We're praying for her, that the Lord would be with her in a great and in a gracious way. Praying for Brother Joe Lalo's uh, 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 daughter-in-law, uh, daughter right? That lost a child 
And uh, uh, so we're praying for her that God would fill that void, that vacuum in her life, and certainly an emotional, emotional thing for them. And we're praying about all these things, and God bless you. If you're here today and you have a prayer need, and you'd like to indicate that to our Lord, would you raise your hand and let God see your hand? Thank you. God sees your hand. All of you, God's looking right at you. And back here, God sees you. Thank you here. And right there, uh, let God touch you. And uh, God bless your heart. Uh, take a microphone back there to Brother Green. And if he is uh, able to, Brother Chris, I want him to lead us to the Lord in prayer. Now, again, uh, let me say this to you. Uh, if, if you're sucking your thumb and pacifier and feeling sorry for yourself yeah. and everything, uh, you sit in that man's seat for a while right there that fights for a, a li a life daily, just daily. And uh, I'll tell you, the doctors have lost uh, their word. They, they look like uh, uh, that they don't know uh, maybe the way home. And uh, so he has uh, uh, proven that our God is greater Amen. than their Amen. medicine. Amen. Amen. And I've had so many doctors say, well, it's out of, uh, it's out of our hands now. And I, said, it's, I say, it's been out of your hands ever since uh, uh, I was saved. Amen. Amen. And, and we love you, Brother Green. Appreciate your courage and uh, your admonition to us and encouragement to all of us. Uh, you pray for our, our service, for the message today, and for these friends who lifted their hand. Brother Green. Our dear Father, Lord, we come to you this morning, dear God, just to say thank you and praise you, dear Lord, for everything that you've done. For it's all through you. It's nothing that we would have done or ever will do. Lord, you've seen the hands that were raised this yes, morning. You know each and every need, dear God. We're going to trust and believe in you to take care of these needs, dear God. And Lord, be in this service this morning, dear Lord. As the choir sings, may they make a joyful noise unto yes, you, my father. dear God. And as Brother Gross comes before us, dear God, may your hand be lifted up on him and your light shining down on him, dear Lord. To give him the message, dear Lord, for us. Yes. And most of all, if there's one that's lost this morning, Lord, that they come unto you for the free pardon of sin, dear God. May your will and way be done, and may we glorify and praise you in your yes. name. Amen. 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 Now, I want you to act, uh, act like you're in church. Amen. Yes. And uh, the Bible says, come into his presence with uh, uh, singing and uh, praise. And so uh, you feel free to do that. Amen. Follow this fellow. All right. Turn to page number 26 in your book. I pull the string on you, Angie. I wanted to sing this anyway. I love this song. One of my favorites. Aren't you thankful you have a Lord that loved you enough to come and die for you? I tell you what. All we got to do is trust him. And can it be that we should gain? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood that He for me who caused His pain for me to live to death. 
things that come our way we don't understand yes sometimes on a daily basis you're like what in the world is going on here aren't you glad that although we don't know what tomorrow may hold we do know who's in control and who holds tomorrow yes amen i want you to listen to this word blessed be his name amen amen serve God as any other day. Bound and determined to live in God's favor, nothing would stand in his way. Then the messengers came one by one with their story. In just a few moments, Job lost all he had. Great wealth and riches, the health of his body, even his children were dead. The Lord given, he faketh away, blessed be the name. Just curse God and die. Job rose from the ashes. He put toward the heavens and brushed back the tears in his eyes. And he said, The Lord give he taketh away. Blessed be the name of the
this. It is like this. Created in his image. For I was like everybody else does. I've often thought, oh, what I did, what I can fool with this. And the reason is, he's just done too much for me. He's done so much for me, I owe him all the best I can give him. And I don't do it all the time, and I'm ashamed of that. But I'm thankful that deep in my heart, page 154, stand with me, would. Although... We're not what we want to be. We're not what we ought to be. God sees me through his son. He doesn't look upon me. Amen. It is well with my soul. I pray it's that way for you this morning. When peace like a river attendeth my way when so
I'm in there too. I, actually, I kind of in there sometimes. Yeah. Hey, Amen. Thank you, Lord. All right, page 159, verse number three. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole. Listen to this. It's nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh, my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Even so, and Lord, haste the day when the face shall be sighed. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. may be seen. Amen. If it's not well with your soul, it can be today. Jesus said, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You don't have to leave this morning with trouble in your soul. Ain't you glad? I'm glad I settled it long ago. Well, hallelujah. The kids are going to sing this morning for you. And I'm thankful for Miss Kim working with them and singing and uh, learning songs. Miss Natalie Stroud is I found out she played the piano, so I said, you're going to start playing for our children's choir, all right? And uh, so she's on the piano this morning. I thank God for her. And they're going to sing a song, Oh, Say That I'm Glad. Aren't you glad the Lord saved you? Amen. Sing out now. Thank you so much. There is nothing more beautiful than the cheerful voices of children singing. And I'll tell you what, it makes me feel a responsibility. I know it does you uh, for that generation that is to come, that God would uh, touch them in a very special way. Now, to those of you there, uh, these kids come from uh, situations that uh, uh, you would not believe. It's amazing what uh, some of them uh, comes from and out of. And I praise God for an opportunity to love and serve them and try to help them uh, in a great, gracious way. And God bless you. Thank you all for being here today. All right, the Awanas will begin September the 9th. That is this Wednesday. And pray God that God would bless and give us a fruitful year with many souls coming to Christ. And we're looking forward to uh, uh, some giving their life to the Lord and working with the kids. Some of them will learn scores and scores and, and, and literally books of verses uh, in this coming year of Awanas. And uh, so we look forward to the uh, meeting together on Wednesday. And uh, God bless you. All right, please uh, note your bulletin. There are several meetings set aside. And I hope that you will uh, take notice of these things. 
and uh, God bless you. There'll be a teacher's meeting tonight after church, and I uh, want to need all the teachers, all the Sunday school workers uh, in the meeting after the service tonight back in the Husky classroom and be right in your place. And, of course, uh, we want to work on this theme. Uh, I want that mountain. That's what Caleb said to Joshua. He said, God told me I could have that mountain, and I want that mountain. Now, uh, he had to do something to get it. Amen. And so he armed himself and he took the mountain. Now God's speaking to you, to me. And uh, if you want to uh, uh, live on another plane with the Lord, then you work toward that. And God bless you. We'll challenge the teachers. And uh, God bless you. And pray for the thing. Pray for the youth Bible study on Tuesday at 6 o'clock. Be right in your place for the youth Bible study that God would touch there. And then our service Wednesday, we are teaching on suffering. And uh, not one person, not one person in, in this auditorium today is exempt from suffering. We all go through that valley, and I'm try I want to help you to understand it in light of the Word of God. Nothing new, you know that. Uh, but we all have that to deal with. And so be here on Wednesday, and let me talk to you about suffering. We're going to suffering from the beginning of Genesis to the end in Revelation when he says no more. And uh, praise God for that promise right from his word. Thursday soul winning, be right in your place. Pardon me. We are uh, launching out uh, a saturation campaign to our neighborhoods. Uh, here is a copy of the gospel. Uh, 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 this is John and Romans. The, it's, a, it's a highlighted edition for the plan of salvation. And uh, uh, that booklet uh, right there. And then a gift from us, a copy of the a little uh, frameable copy of the Ten Commandments that we want to put. We are going to put these in 5,000 homes, all right? Now, on this side of the road, from here on this side of 27, down to uh, Battlefield Parkway, there are 600 homes, 600. Okay, that, uh, that is where we're going to start. We're going to start street by street until we put uh, uh, this packet in the uh, in homes of all those 600 homes. And then we will start that way toward Rossville and do that. And then, of course, across the street, same in those directions. Over 5,000 of these, as it's our goal, to put the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, John and Roman, and then a letter from the pastor here, some literature in here. And so I hope that you will come on Thursday and choose you a street and we will put these packets in your hands, and then when, uh, when you can, when you can get to it, between Thursday and Monday, we'd like for you to begin to work on that. I don't know how long it'll take you to do your street. Some of the streets have many, many, many houses. The street on which I live has five different roads going off of it that, that will have to be uh, gone to, and so a lot of these streets are that way. So you come and take part in that wonderful, wonderful thing. God will reward you richly. Now you say, why should I? Uh, I think the message this morning will answer that, and, uh, or the, the beginning of the message this morning. Uh, it is kind of the uh, alpha, uh, but not the omega uh, of that, and God bless you. All right, ushers, come forward. We'll receive our offering, give you an opportunity to give to the work of God. I don't know, is the clock working? I see that the time has changed, and of course, even a bad clock is right twice today. And uh, and so I don't know if it's a clicking or not. Yeah, I see the second hand going, I think. Uh, it, uh, it, it foiled me Wednesday night. I was teaching on suffering, and I got plugged in on it. I was trying to help people and help me, and, and, I, and, I, and I looked at that big hand. I just look at the big hand. I don't worry about that small one. I like big things. So uh, that big hand said 15 till. Well, I taught another 15, 20 minutes, and I looked at it again, and it still said 15 till. Oh, boy, I'm getting in a lot tonight, and, I, and that, that occurred several times. And then finally I looked at my watch, and it didn't say 15 till. It said 15 after. And so uh, uh, and then we had an Awanas meeting after the service. And so uh, I let a lot of weary people go. I, I, I started to let them off uh, Sunday morning because I kept them so long Wednesday night uh, doing that series. But uh, they got the clock fixed, so you don't have to worry just get you a good deep breath, get comfortable, open your heart to the Lord, let him help you if you will uh, do that. Brother Eddie is going to come and ask God's blessings on this offering. And I'll tell you what, I, I love the workers in this church. Uh, I love this choir director. 
I, I do with all my heart, with his family. And uh, uh, everything is right about him. I promise you that. And I love him. And, uh, boy, you do not know. Uh, uh, this man has to touch God because when he sings, the song compliment the message. And God certainly is, uh, speaks to his heart. But, well, lady, I love you and appreciate your love for this church, for, the, for your pastor, most of all for your Lord. And you come and pray for this offering, if you will. What you just said, may I thank you for praying for me. Because there are many times that I don't know what to do. And I'm kind of up against the wall, and the, the Lord will open the window for me. And I just praise him and thank him for someone praying for me. That's what it's all about. We're a family here. I love each and every one of you. And when you're not here, I miss you. I want you to know that. There ain't nothing thrills my soul like see Stella Lamar back there. Because it's getting where it's hard for them to be here. I know that. But see, I've grown up under those people for 45, 45 years now, I think. I've been around this place. God's good, isn't he? Amen. I tell you what, I love him for what he's done in my life. Father, we praise you this morning for your goodness and your mercy toward us. Father, we thank you that we know you. Oh, I love what Brother Jim said. Know you whom to know is life eternal. Praise your name, Lord, for all you've done in this place. Father, I thank you for the service this morning. I thank you for the yes. privilege of being here, for worshiping you, for filling your spirit. Deal with us, Lord. And I pray that you move on the service as Pastor brings the message this morning. Father, prepare the hearts of those to hear it. Yes. Father, may we not only hear it, but may we do it. Lord, help us in everything that we do. We always be careful to give you the honor and the praise and the glory. Father, bless this offering. Lord, it may be used for your glory and your honor. In Christ's name, I ask. Amen. Hallelujah, great and marvelous are thy ways, Lord God Almighty. What a Savior, amen. Did you notice when the kids sang, oh, say, but I'm glad, they were smiling. They weren't up here like this. That doesn't represent gladness very well, does it? Amen. Ladies, y'all come and sing about our Savior this morning. I'm Lord, for we sing that um, I'm just so thankful for his love and 
his goodness and his mercy. Um, there's a lot of people that's hurting in here today, and I know they are. But I'm just so thankful for his goodness and that we have him to go to, even when things get really hard. Because my favorite promise in the Bible is, I will never leave you or forsake you. So I just want to thank him for his love. So much wonderful thank you and God bless you oh isn't it wonderful to be redeemed the word redeemed a redemption comes from the word goel and it means to be bought back and I'll tell you what I had sold my soul and life into the slave market of sin and when I was 24 years old the Holy Spirit of God spoke to my heart and showed me the the track I was on, the era of my ways. And I turned in faith to the Lord the fact that all my sins were placed on him 2,000 years ago. And God hath made him to be sin for me. He knew no sin that I might be made the righteousness of the Lord, of God in him. And I praise the Lord for redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of his mercy. And I say nothing in my hands I bring simply to the cross I cling. 
not the pleadings of my hands could fulfill thy laws demand could my will no respite no could my tears forever flow these for sin could not atone thou must save and thou alone and praise God for redemption in the Lord Jesus Christ all right I'm going to need some understanding on your part this morning as I approach the scripture the most simple facts that I can give will be given this morning. Uh, as simple as the Word of God can be uh, before you. And I want to share with you uh, what's on my heart. Uh, I have uh, uh, started at 2.30 in the mornings, and the Holy Spirit wouldn't let me go. I went to, back to my house uh, two times, maybe three times this morning uh, to, uh, because it just kept pouring on me from above, and I kept getting it which is to say uh, it won't be like Wednesday night so you can relax. I, I will cut it off. Uh, uh, someone said my, my message is like a stick of baloney. You can just whack it off wherever you want it, all right? And uh, I'll whack it off here in time for you to get to the dinner uh, line and uh, uh, maybe beat uh, uh, some of the longer-winded preachers than me, okay? And uh, God bless you. God bless you. Eternity is at stake this morning. And I realize that. I realize that uh, as I stand here, that uh, I'm going to deal with eternal things. I, I realize that uh, uh, the souls of some hang in the balances. I, I realize that uh, uh, the very eternity will be determined by your response to what God says to you today or has said. And so I want to be as helpful as I possibly can be, but straightforward. And you must get this, okay? And uh, God bless you. Having said that, let me ask you to stand to your feet and honor the reading of the Lord's Word and pass out several compliments. Be very kind to those around you. Edify someone, would you? <clears throat> Thank you so much. And let me direct your attention to the Word of God in Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. And then put your finger there and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And then hold that place and go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If I read and you start looking tired... I'll let you sit down, okay? Or if you're ti too tired to stand, you can sit down right now. But if you're able to stand at all, let's stand and honor the reading of our Lord's Word. And uh, after I read the first verse, you are welcome to respond to me for the rest of the reading. First, uh, Romans chapter 14, Romans chapter 14, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 7. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live unto the Lord or whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it naught, thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For as it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12. I'll read the first verse. And you respond, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, 
and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I will begin reading in verse 10, and you kindly respond to me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive of the things done in his body according that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that you may have somewhat to answer them that glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God. Or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. And now, Heavenly Father, I ask you, I am so glad that I have a Father in heaven as well as on earth, but you are the eternal Father the everlasting God, the Prince of Peace. Lord, I praise you this morning for the Word of God that liveth and abideth forever. I yield myself to you as the servant of God, and may you speak through these lips of clay as an oracle of God. Touch our hearts. I pray, Lord, that some may come today to be saved and some may rededicate their lives to the Lord. And Lord, whatever you have for us this morning, Impress on our hearts in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. The word judgment, judge, judges, and judgeth is used 675 times in the Bible. God need only to use any word or any thought one time for it to be both relevant and sure. But God uses the word judgment 675 times in one form or the other. Now, I ask you, do you think that it is vital that we find out about this since God puts such emphasis, em emphasis on it? Then the word labor. The word labor is used probably a hundred and something times in the Word of God, over and over and over, the word labor is used. The, the poet said, I would not work my soul to save, for this my Lord hath done. But I would work like any slave for love of God's dear Son. This word, judgment, there's Several judgments in the Word of God. Doctrinally speaking, it divides denominations. It is where the, the, the Nazarenes, the Presbyterian, uh, the Church of God, the Pentecostals, uh, the Baptists all differ in this word right here. This word, when someone sees judgment or judge, they think of one judgment. But the Word of God tells us that in all the teaching of judgment throughout the Bible, and there's many, many, many of them, remember that word judge, judges, judges is used 675 times, and in every occasion it can be a different word in several respects. Now, when you find the word judgment in the Bible, know this, that the judgments differ in at least three respects. Number one, the question is to be asked when you see judgment, who 
is being judged. Who is in the context? Is he speaking of uh, Israel? Is he speaking of lost people? Is he speaking of saved people? Who is being judged? That's the first question. Question number two. Where, where is this judgment taking place? You see, for some of these judgments will take place on earth. And then some of these judgments will take place in heaven. Uh, the, the fact is that, that, that uh, uh, the, so, some of these judgments go like this. The, the sin of the believer. My sin has been judged already. 2,000 years ago, God took all of my sins. Rotten. I don't want to glorify what I was or my sin, but God took all of my sins. All of you former drunkards, all uh, of you immoral people, all of our sins, God took all of our sins and placed them on the Lamb of God who was Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And the Bible says he took away the sin of the world and he died and paid our sin debt. You see, the wages of sin is death. And, and the Word of God says, death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. And Jesus paid our sin debt 2,000 years ago. And if by faith you realize the condition you're in as a sinner before a holy God, and you look to Calvary and accept His forgiveness, His payment for your sins, he will take your sin and give you the gift of eternal life. He will come into your heart. He will write your name down in heaven in the Lamb's book of life. And you can live forever and forever and ever in the bliss of God. Now, you're going to live forever anyway. The question is where? So, we see that judgment of self or the sinner or the judgment of the sinner. Number two, you see the, the, the judgment of self, the sinner first, then the self. The Word of God tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Brother LeBron, that, that we are to judge ourselves daily and many times throughout the day. I am to examine myself. I am to lay myself before the Lord. I am to expose myself to the light of the Word of God and see how it is in my heart. The judgment of self daily here on earth. And then there is a judgment called the great white throne of judgment. There's one in the valley of Megiddo where the final end shall come and God will judge there. There's the judgment of Israel. There is the judgment of nations. There is the judgment of angels. And all this will come before the Lord. But the great white throne of judgment is the judgment for sinners. Judgment to those who have refused to accept Jesus as their personal Savior. You say, that's not fair. I'll tell you, what more could you do than to give your own son for the sins of another? And that's what God did. He gave his own son that he loved, who was in the bosom of the Father for trillions of years. He gave his son so you could be forgiven your sins. I could be forgiven of my sins. We have no excuse before God. If you turn down the salvation of God, if you're in this building this morning, you're lost without Christ, and you walk out of that door, and you draw your last breath, and you die, you will stand at the great white throne of judgment and be judged before a holy God. You won't be judged for your salvation. You'll be, uh, you'll be judged and, and, and uh, uh, degrees of, of punishment will be meted out to you forever and ever and ever. That is the great white throne of judgment. Thank God I won't go there, except that I will go there, but just as a, not a, as a viewer. Then the one I'm talking about this morning is this one, the judgment seat of Christ that we read to you from uh, Romans chapter 14, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and 2 Corinthians chapter 5 all dealing with the judgment seat of Christ. Listen to this. This gets my attention. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord. 
we persuade men. Hey, I called on this church to have part, to take some of these packets, go to a street, put the Word of God in the hands of people who need to be saved, who are uh, doomed and damned and condemned to hell, and give them a chance. Give them a chance like you've had. Give them a chance to be saved. And uh, uh, again, now why did I do that? Therefore, says the Apostle Paul, the greatest Christian this side of Calvary, Paul said, therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. My question is this, what is the terror of the Lord to the believer? What is the terror of the Lord to a born-again person standing at the judgment seat of Christ? What's so terrible about it? What's bad about it? You see, folks, uh, we are eternally saved. If I didn't want to go to heaven, I should have never got saved. I can't do anything about being saved. I am a child of God. I was born of Roy Gross in 1943. I came from his loins and his blood. Now, I don't, listen, my friend, I could go to the courthouse and destroy the records. But the fact is, whose son would I be? I would still be Roy Gross's son. I could deny that I'm Roy Gross' son, but whose son would I still be? I could turn against my dad. I could, I, I could take their, his mother's life. But I ask you, whose son would I be? I would be Roy Gross' son. And I was born of him, and that cannot be undone. In 1968, guess what? I had a second birth. I was born from above. I was, I was begotten by the Word of God. I am the Son of God. I am as pure in the eyes of God as Jesus uh, the, the Savior is. I am as blameless, as faultless, as uncondemned as is Jesus Christ, the Savior, Messiah of the world, coming King. I am free from condemnation, Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. I am free from separation, Romans chapter 8, 32 and on. I say this to you, my friend, I am born again. Amen. Now, again, I say this to you. What is the terror of the Lord? Let me say this. Some of y'all should not be bothered by it. But there's some of you and some of us, may I say, that should tremble at the thought of knowing the terror of the Lord. We haven't persuaded men. We haven't been a witness. We haven't lived for him. We have not sown the seed. Hey, listen, I'm, I'm trying to help you at the judgment seat. If you're here and saved, you know this, you're going to judgment. If you're saved, you're going to the judgment seat of Christ. And the greatest Christian that ever lived said, therefore, in light of that judgment, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuaded men. I want to ask you a question. Is there anyone in this building that, that would doubt the fact that we are living on the brink, the end of this thing? Brother Dale was talking to me about a, a man's message, and boy, it made me hunger. And, and I said, I want that. And, and, and it's about the coming of the Lord. And I'm looking for Jesus. And incidentally, he may come before we say amen in this service. Jesus may come, and you'll go to either the judgment seat of Christ for, for born-again people, or you'll go to the great white throne of judgment. Now, let me ask you a question. Why should I go to a judgment? I'm saved. I'm saved forever. Uh, I'm going to come off of this and teach you what the Bible says about eternal salvation. Because some folks still have a little bit of problem with that. And I'm going to teach you line upon line, precept upon precept, what eternal salvation is. What does it mean that we can never be lost? What does it mean? They, 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 they badger us and they say, if I believe like you folks do, that you can't lose your salvation, I would go out and sin all I want to. Well, I do sin not all I want to, but more than I want to. I mean, in light of the judgment, I don't want to sin. But I have a, I have a battle within myself, this old nature. 
that was born from Adam number one. I mean, it gets on my trail and badgers me day and night. From, while I'm asleep, it is there. I have bad dreams. I think bad thoughts in my sleep. I wake up praying. I say this to you, my friend. Sometimes I feel like I'm lost to battle over the flesh and the carnal nature. But I know that I'll stand before God, and so will you. It went one way or the other. Now, let me give you this illustration, and, I'm, uh, and I'll let you go. Brother Curtis Hudson gave this. Let's say <laughs> that you go up here to Lovell Field, and you pay your fare as you purchase an airline ticket to Atlanta, Georgia. Now, uh, help me. Uh, where are you at? At Lovell Field, Chattanooga. Where are you at? Chattanooga. And you bought a ticket, and where are you going? You're going to Atlanta, Georgia. Now, you board the plane. It taxes the runway. And all of a sudden, you uh, there, and there's five crying babies around you. They're sneezing. A guy on this side is coughing. And uh, another is looking at a bad magazine. And you call the stewardess and you say to her, to her, Ma'am, I don't like this seat. I don't like this seat. She says, Well, I'm sorry, sir. That is your appointed seat. Uh, but you say, I want another seat. I don't like it here. I'm sorry, sir. And you, and you take out your fingernail clippers. And you grab a, a lock of her blonde hair and you clip off a lock of her hair. And, and, and you say, uh, she, how dare you do that? So she goes and knocks on the cabin door, announces herself as being a steward, and she, and she says, uh, 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 Sir, Captain, we have an unruly uh, passenger back there. Says he don't like his seat. Now, uh, 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 now you're 10,000 feet. Now you have ascended. If you go to Atlanta, you just do like this. And I ask you a question. Where are you going? Uh, that's not enough. I want more help. Where are you going? Atlanta. Atlanta. Okay, so the captain comes back, and he says to you, uh, he says, now listen, fella. He says, is there a problem? And you say, uh, yes, sir, there is. I don't like this seat. I want another seat. Take me to another seat. And the captain says, sir, the plane is full. Every seat is taken. This is your assigned seat. Now, you listen to me. Everyone here has an assigned seat in life. I mean, the fact is God has a will for every life in here. And I don't know specifically, but I can tell you generally, God's will has to do with other people, and you are to be a witness for him. I'm telling you, every person in this building this morning needs to come and get these and pick him a street and go and start sowing the seed of God's Word. I'm telling you, are you listening to me? You're going to judgment. I'm going to judgment. I'm going to judgment for being faithful to the Lord and telling you this this morning, whether I obeyed the Lord or not. Well, listen, folks. Therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, I'm going to tell you the truth. You can bank on that. Now, again, so... You, you grab the captain's tie, and you take your little file thing, and you start trying to saw his tie off. And he says, what do you mean, fella? Do we have a marshal on this plane? No, we don't have a marshal on this plane. Well, he says, okay. And the, and the captain turns around and walks off. You're still sitting there grumbling over your seat that you have, your assigned seat. Then the plane begins to descend. Ladies and gentlemen, pass, fasten your seat belt. We're about to land at uh, Atlanta Airport, and, uh, so, and then the plane lands. Goes down and up to the uh, place where the, you disembark, and there they start getting off the plane. Well, as you approach the door, now hopefully, if you'd been behave yourself, a pretty lady would say unto you, thank you for flying Delta. I hope that you enjoyed your flight, and I hope that you will fly with us again. And you smile, and you think, well, I believe she likes me. Now, you can get off the plane and have that. You're at your concourse. Where are you at? Wait just a minute. You behaved bad on the way there. You misbehaved yourself. You became rowdy. 
how come you in Atlanta? You should have been pitched out the side door. But that's not what happens. You see, folks, your destination is where? Atlanta. And so you go and step out into the little tube tunnel right there. And the stewardess doesn't say, sir, thank you for flying Delta. I hope you had a pleasant flight. And I hope that you'll fly with us again. uh, What she does is she points to you. And just right inside that little tube tunnel, there are five black-dressed guys. They have ball bats and chains. They have paraphernalia and a straitjacket. And they seize, lay seize on you. You see, your behavior on the way there did not stop you from getting to Atlanta. And neither will your behavior on the way to heaven stop you from getting to heaven. But your reception when you get there is going to be determined by your behavior on the way. And I ask you a question. What does this mean to you? I was pushing for a Sunday school thing, and, and one of the leaders in the church says, I'll preach her, you know, you know you put, like, don't pay attention to him. Well, I, I, you should be ashamed of yourself. And I say this to you, friend. What you need to do is say, our preacher loves us, and he's trying to give a, get us a good standing at the judgment seat of Christ, because you're going to stand there if you say. Isn't that what he says in chapter 14 of Romans? We shall all stand. Before the judge. And we shall get, every man shall give an account of his self. I don't have to account for her. I don't have to account for you, Brother Eddie. Account for you. I have to account for me. Have I obeyed the Lord? I'd like to, uh, 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 to have preached to you about heaven. But I'm obeying the Lord because therefore knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Now, let me close with this. It, it is time. It is time that we at Victor Baptist Church get serious about the coming of Jesus and going to heaven. It is time that we, uh, 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 that we quit sitting aside. Oh, you say, uh, I have spent my years here. Well, you, this is not prison. You have, had, you have been here years and had opportunities. That man said, I've been here 40 years. Some of you have been here years and years. It's not as though you're punished. Uh, Hey, listen, let the rest of them do it now. You're going to judgment. And and, and John puts it this way. You be careful that you don't lose your reward. You young folks used to walk with God and be closer to God than you are, but you've grown a little cold because you got, uh, maybe you're too old to serve the Lord now, and you've backed down just a little bit. You don't have that drive, that, 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 that fear of God like you used to have. And I'm telling you, you better step it back up because you go into judgment too. And the, the terror of the Lord is going to be terrible for you. You seniors, I thank God for Ms. Yarman. She said, give me work to do. Let me pack things. Let me do the work of God. Ms. Jones said, I don't want to feel unnecessary. I want to work. I want to serve God. Well, why are they doing that? To get saved? They're doing that because they are saved. They're doing that for the love of the Savior. Now, let me close with this as Brother Eddie is preparing a song. Listen right here. You've heard this as many times as you've heard that I drove to Middle Tennessee, Tennessee State University for a doctor's degree for two and a half years. You've heard that many times. How many of y'all ever heard that story? Yeah, I know you have. And I'm tempted to tell you again, just because I like the story. You've heard this. When I was in high school, at Gordon Lee High School, I played on the football team. We had on that football team the Gil Strauss, uh, whose father was a judge. Uh, We had on that football team Hagemans, whose dad owned a bunch of the carpet mills and, and everything. Wealthy people. We had on that football team uh, Dr. Pope's son, Johnny Pope. And Johnny Pope, the doctor's son, went, came to the football team, and he said, I want to, y'all to come to my birthday party. He gave us all an open invitation to come to his birthday party, Dr. Pope in Chickamauga, one doctor that the city had. And he said, I want you to come to my birthday. I went and asked my dad, I said, Dad, can, can I go to Dr. Pope's 
a uh, son's birthday party, and Dad said, son, uh, those are rich people, and we're farmers, sharecroppers. Uh, uh, son, we're different from them, and, and, and I don't want them to look down on you. You're as good as any man, but I don't know that they know it. And son, I wouldn't want you to be embarrassed. I said, please, Dad, the whole football team is going to Johnny Pope's birthday dinner. Can I go? And Dad said, okay, you can go. But you know curfew. You know what time you're going to be back. Now, here I was, a young teenager, prideful. So I, I began to walk. I walked, it was about five-something miles. Wherever I went, I had to walk. I walked from Wallaceville to Boeing's Hill in Ch- Chickamauga. I walked up to Dr. Pope's house. As I approached that house, there was big, quiet columns, three-story house going up. Uh, I suddenly was intimidated. I was insecure anyway. I was a little bony fellow, rugged as, rugged as uh, uh, nails. I mean, uh, uh, you, know what, you know what our Ferris wheel and, and roller coaster was? Swinging pine trees. And sometimes we swung them, and the south was going the wrong direction, and they body slammed us. And I fell 30 feet many a time and hit and knocked the breath out of them and got up and went to the next tree. Uh, but the fact is, I suddenly realized I'm a poor boy. I have pasteboard in my shoes. I have holes, and I put pasteboard in there so my feet wouldn't hit the pavement. And uh, uh, I hoped it didn't rain that day. I have holes in my shoes. Uh, my, my underwear's a little uh, worn and has maybe a, a, a torn place in it, and everything is clean, as Mother always insisted on. But uh, it was a little, little worn. And I said, uh, I, I'm a poor person. I'm poor. And uh, maybe I should go back home. Well, uh, I pushed the doorbell, and it rang the fifth symphony. And about that time, a maid opened the door. A black maid, and she said to me, Sir. When she said, Sir, now I've been called a lot of things in my lifetime. But at that point, as a teenager, I hadn't been called Sir. And I looked around, see if there's anybody else behind me. I said, Well, just just me and her, so she must be speaking to me. And I said, Yes, ma'am. She said, "Uh, Who shall I announce? I said, "Uh, I am Ernest Gross. And she said, Mr. Gross, I will announce you. Step in, please. I stepped in that door. And there was a spiral staircase that wound and went up to the third floor with landings on the second floor and the third floor. I looked and there was a huge crystal chandelier hanging down. Oh, it was that. She was gone down the hall to announce me, and my jaw dropped. I was standing there in the foyer. That didn't look like where I lived. I mean, where I lived, you looked at the back end, uh, the the south end of a northbound mule all the time. So I said, I need to leave. Well, she comes back and she says, Mr. Gross, Johnny said, come on down. Well, I could hear the laughter as I walked down that long hall. I could hear my football team cutting up and enjoying each other and joking and jostling. And I got close and started to step into the door. Come on, Brother Eddie, with a song. Look right here. I started to step in that door. I thought, I hope they don't know my shoe. I have holes in my shoes and pasteboard. I hope that they don't. And all of a sudden, I saw a table to my right. And on that table were wrapped, beautifully wrapped, gifts with bows and silk on them with a doctor's son. And all of a sudden, it hit me. I'm a poor person. I don't have a gift. I don't have a gift to give this rich doctor's son. And all of a sudden, I felt like everyone in that room knew about the pasteboard in my shoes. 
that they knew how I was dre dressed underneath. And I was humiliated. I was intimidated. I fought tears. I cursed the day that I was born. I was so intimidated. But you know what those guys, hey, gross, come on in. You see, the fact is, I had won several championships in the ring at that point, and they had no idea that I had pasteboard in my shoes, and neither did they care. They had no idea about my impoverty, about my insecurities, and I stepped on into that room. We laughed, and I tried to get involved in it, but I had a lump in my throat. And then I walked back the five miles at a certain time back to Wallaceville where I lived. I think I may have cried when I got part of the way back and no one was looking. I think I wept. And I said, I'll never be caught like that again. I went on with life and made some bad decisions. I dishonored my daddy and my mother that was the finest Christians that this earth has ever known, the salt of the earth. I made some bad decisions. I married a wonderful girl, my wife, one of the most virtuous, clean women I've ever seen, and I drug her down with me. I'm not glorifying my sin. I'm ashamed. In 1968, my wife decided it's time for me was raised in church to be back in church. And incidentally, we have church here on Sunday night and on Wednesday. And have I told you you're going to the judgment? And that morning in June of 1968, the Holy Ghost told me that I was a sinner. <laughs> Oh, I had heard it before, but not like this. I had put a condition on God and his salvation. And God said, I'm the offended party. I named the terms of reconciliation. God said, trust me this morning or go to hell. Oh, I knew that morning that something had to change. And I got up from my bench walked down that aisle I knelt in that altar and I said dear God I'm trusting your word you tell me that I'm a sinner I know that you tell me I owe a sin debt the wages of sin is death and I know that and I said you tell me that Jesus your son paid my sin debt and by faith I didn't have a tear I didn't have an emotion, but by faith, Brother Joe, I turned in faith to Calvary. I said, I accept that payment into my heart. And when I did that, God wrote my name down in heaven. And when I did that, God gave me the gift of eternal life. When I got up, my friends, as was the custom in those days, said to me, how do you feel? I said, I trusted Jesus as my personal Savior this morning. I'm counting on him. And I walked out the church door, and I got in my car, and I took the ignition key and stuck it in the ignition, and for the first time after I was saved, the Holy Ghost of God said to me, it will never be the same. It will never be the same. Well, I went and told people I got saved, and my parents said to me, well, you've been saved a long time. But I wasn't. I was a lost member of a church. I was lost. I'd never been born again. So I was baptized, and then I dedicated myself, and I said to God that morning, I'm going to die with your help. I'm going to die serving you with your help. And no, I can't. The next day, I was confronted and insulted, and I stomped my foot because I was quite intemperate at that time. I had a fuse about that long, and I was very destructive. 
But I stomped my foot and I said one word. And when I did, I found out what the Holy Ghost meant when he said, it will never be the same. Because I was stabbed clear through with the sword of God. I was convicted and right down here by Roy's grill on the sidewalk, I busted out to weeping. I had already failed the Lord. I had already blown it. And before that week was out, the Holy Ghost spoke to me again. And here's what he said. We're about to, I'm about to let you go, but please listen. You need to hear this. He said to me, son, do you remember Johnny Pope's birthday dinner? And I said, yes, sir. I'm talking, he's talking to my heart now. And he said, son, you're going to the coronation of my son. And he said, do you remember not having a gift give the doctor son and I said yes sir the pain came again and he said are you going to have a gift for my son at his coronation and I wept and I determined in my heart from that day forward I would live every day in light of a coming judgment. <laughs> Where I would stand before God <laughs> and give an account. <laughs> I have tried to live right and clean but I've stumbled and I've messed up but I'm forgiven because back then on the cross all my sins were future he paid them all and I accepted that payment and I ask you today have you have you accepted that payment? If not this morning, what a, what a trade, what a deal. You give God your sins, and he'll give you the righteousness of his son. This morning, believer, child of God, born again person, I beg you, if I could come to every bench and kneel by you, I would beg you to get the lease on this thing of the judgment seat of Christ that God placed in my heart by personal experience, a birthday party. And every one of us shall stand at the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the things he hath done or failed to do. Now, Notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the word works, don't, don't miss this, are used about five times. Every man's work and your work and nothing about your salvation but work. And the judgment seat of Christ is about your works. Oh, you say you're fanatical, guilty, but I'm going to judgment. And my knee will bow and my tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. I want to hear one thing from up there. I want to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant oh dear God in the name of Jesus I beg you this morning may I be faithful may I be faithful help oh father today if I could convict I would but I can't 
so I'll leave that to your hands. I pray that you would, your people may feel a need to prepare themselves to that judgment and they'd come and make some decisions about their life with you. Touch us this morning in a special way in Christ's name, amen. God's love for you will never change. I'll give you a statement that I've used for years and years and years. And that is this, I could not live so good that God would love me any more than he loves me right now. Yes, and I could not live so bad that he would love me any less than he loves me right now. Yes, 